everybody, this is Brian. I'm just doing a sound check to make sure that everything is coming through loud and clear on the stream. Thank you very much. Talk to you later.
start? Okay. Hi, everyone. Everyone all the way in the back. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. This is the third Digital Delights um, talk for this spring semester. Um, I'm Peter Saram. I'm the chair of the Communications and Media Studies Department here at John Cabot. And then I also work with Professor Arasa, Professor Mitali, um, and the entire department to uh, sort of organize and run the Digital Delights series. Uh, tonight, we have the pleasure of having here with us and hosting Officers Mark Cote and Jennifer Pibus. Um, and a talk that sort of originates in their um, research. I'll leave most of the talking to them. Um, the title of the talk is A Trillion Dollar Platform in Your Pocket, um, or actually, uh, repeat it, A Trillion Dollar Platform in Your Pocket, with a question mark, I guess. Um, and it looks like uh, we're in for a treat. This looks like a really interesting venture into the various apps that um, live in our so-called smartphones. And they are smart. Um, and the processes of sort of hyper-concentration and monopolization that underlie our engagement with these software tools. I know many of you are in um, you know, the various digital media culture classes, so you should uh, get all the sort of references. Um, I think what we get tonight is a kind of guide on the ecosystem that exists in the mobile phones and the, the networks that sort of work around them. Um, in what we hold in our hands, in the pockets, or in our pockets, um, and how they, they've been transforming our life into these data points, uh, which are then sort of transformed uh, for a limited range of access. I'll briefly introduce um, both of the speakers. Mark Cote is Reader in Data and Society in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London, and he's also the Director of King's College's Data, Culture, and Society master's program, MA program. Um, his work crosses different disciplines and institutions, and his research is concentrated on the intersections of the human and the technical. Um, he approaches a technical object from an informed perspective. He looks under the hood, which is what a lot of critical theorists tend to not do um, for various reasons. Um, at, but at the same time, you know, sort of evading that kind of tech um, fetishism almost, and always keeping the focus on the human and social repercussions and the societal dimensions of data computation and um, AI. Uh, I think you'll get a lot of that, and I'm sure there'll be questions around that as well. Um, Jennifer Pibus is Canada Research Chair in Data, AI, and Democracy in the Department of Politics at York University, Toronto, and Director of York's new Center for Public um, I think her work also sort of speaks for her, itself. Um, she works around interdisciplinary uh, questions, at the intersection of the digital and algorithmic cultures, exploring the capture and processing of personal data, what you all know is called datafication, um, which is the rendering, the translation through specific strategies of capture and plunder of the social culture and political lives of each one of us into usable data for machine learning and algorithmic decision making. Um, as we'll hear tonight, Mark and Jennifer's work is also a way to empower communities to take possession and engage, first and foremost, understand the processes and their consequences, the impact of using personal data in AI technologies, and the way the sheer scale escapes easy explanation as we traverse digital platforms in our comes from your work, at least that terminology. Um, a reminder to the students that Dr. Cote and Dr. Pibus will also hold a workshop on April 14th at 10 a.m. in GG1, where the plan is to open up and destroy your iPhones and look into them some way, no. Um, but sort of look at what's inside them. Um, I'll be quiet and leave. The final reminder is that we'll have our final Digital Delights talk on April 26th, if I'm not mistaken, and we'll have Nicholas Mirzoev who will be presenting um, his new book. Okay, with that.
How was that? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you very much. We're delighted to be here. Um, we're looking forward to sharing our recent research with you. Um, here's a paper. It's under review right now. Hopefully it will be uh, out very, very soon. So I, I just want to start with some basic statistics. So the average person has about 40 apps on their mobile phone. And the average app has about 18 SDKs. Those SDKs will track, will share, they will process our data. So really, this makes the SDK one of the not just most pervasive, but really the most promiscuous of technical objects in the capture of personal data and in its exploitation. And I use that term exploitation in two ways. One, as a kind of an exploit, which is just kind of doing something computationally, but also exploiting in terms of the tremendous market value that gets generated from our personal data. And that's one thing also that's maybe good to foreground. And it's something that we all know, right? And we're deeply habituated in living in a data for service economy. Most of us, most of the time, are very happy to give up our personal data for a service or whatever that app is doing. And in fact, we usually really want most of all that app to work precisely as we want it to work in that moment. And therefore, that kind of clouds or impacts, I think, the way that we think about our personal data and we think about the kind of evaluation of that. So, okay, I'm gonna ask like really basic question. So just as a quick show of hands, who, who knows what a cookie is? I'm assuming you just don't want to put your hand up. So everybody, I think, knows what a cookie is. Um, probably most people have heard of third parties as well. Um, you've heard of trackers also. But now how many people before this talk had heard of an SDK? So not many, maybe a few, not many. So it, it's really interesting because really the SDK is really a more advanced and integrated uh, version of all of those things within the mobile ecosystem. And so we're going to try to demonstrate the importance of, you know, the most important technical object in the mobile ecosystem that you never heard of or didn't know about. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we do that, I just wanted to really quickly, there are a couple things in, in the, the news in the last few days. So the, the first is that the, the robo taxi. I don't know how many of anybody seen the robo taxi. I mean, we've we've heard about self-driving cars. It's a variation of the self-driving car. Um, it's interesting, not just because it's, it will be fully automated, but because they're thinking about modes of interaction. And right now, they're thinking about kind of music and tone and different haptics um, to ensure the passenger is engaged and doesn't fall asleep and gets out. But what they're also thinking about in the future is, you know, having it be able to always access a personal data feed so that it can personalize your drive, which, again, maybe this is interesting. Potentially, you can personalize it in whichever manner you want. And I'll just note that this will be brought to you by Amazon, okay? So that's, that's the first point. The second is uh, chat GPT. Uh, I read banned yesterday in Italy, so very, very interesting. Um, just, I just wanted to re really quickly kind of give you a, just a really quick background or kind of technically, so I don't know how much you know about how ChatGPT works or how many of you are already using it as an assistant for your studies, something that we all need to think about because I think the one thing that the ChatGPT is, it's, it's an existential threat to the undergraduate uh, essay, I think, in fact. Um, but it's a large language model, right? So, so what it does is it, it, it models probability distributions across really large bodies of text. 
it. So it kind of predicts what word would likely come after another word. Um, and the, the GPT part just means a generative pre-trained model, and this is just a kind of a special kind of large language model, and a transformer, the, the T part, it's, it's just, it's, it's a computational architecture. So it's a neural network. It's a kind of neural network specifically for natural language modeling. So I just wanted to say all of that just to say that transformers have only been around since 2017, and uh, generative pre-trained transformers have only been around since 2018. So this is all within the last five years. And even though OpenAI's ChatGPT is, is very prominent, both were developed by Google, by Google Brain, okay, so it's not Amazon. Now here's just one more, and this was just yesterday. So this is about the AI artificial womb. We've just finished doing a kind of report on social harms from connected devices, and Jennifer did a lot of research on kind of femtech, which is an emerging field. Um, and so this is about, exo they, they call this uh, exogenesis, right? So this is around gestation that's attained in an They've already grown human embryos for 13 days successfully, and they've grown um, actually, uh, I think it's, yeah, that's right, a, a lamb fetus to term already. So it's, it's already functioning. It's using advanced AI, it kind of draws on kind of data from the environment to artificially uh, create uh, an environment in, in, in which life can be sustained. And what I really wanted to draw on this is like there's no regulation. Now, for people born without wombs, for, for trans people, there's potential progressive possibilities. But uh, adjacent to this, I noted to this article, there was an adjacent article within the US, it's called the uh, yeah, Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency, where also they've been uh, surreptitiously taking data from abortion clinics in the US. So there's, you know, we can't say where this is going to go. So let's just kind of take a step back and think about what links all of these things. Well, the first thing is, is data, and it's, it's mostly personal data, right? That's what's really important in all of this. The next is computational power, which is really uh, in significantly, specifically in terms of neural networks, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, and the third are dominant tech giants. Amazon, Google, GAFA, there's, you know, there, there, there are a handful of, of such entities. Um, so yeah, we kind of went from a potentially slightly speculative dystopian future to our kind of slightly dystopian present. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. And what we want to talk about is kind of, of a, we want to talk about SDKs, we want to talk about these technical objects as a way to think about data, as a way to think about this computational processing, as a way to think about the role of tech giants, and as a way to think about how we are all integrated um, within that, right? So if we want to think about how that functions, and, and the thing about the smartphone is they're kind of old now, even though really they're, they've only been around since 2008, but they're so deeply habituated. I think most of you would agree that you would probably turn around, you'd have to be quite far away from your home to not go back if you were starting out your day, if you left your phone behind, or, or just kind of like the psychic pain that you might feel if, if your battery dies and you can't charge your phone and you, know, you have many hours to go. We're just so used to having that. So that's one of the reasons why we find the SDK in the mobile ecosystem so interesting is because of their ubiquity within our everyday life. I wanted to start and give a trajectory of how we got to this point where there's more of a specific focus on the technical object. Because really, for both of us, um, we've come very much from also a kind of digital culture, media studies background and just for different reasons, our research has become increasingly um, transdisciplinary. And one of the things that we want to suggest about that is you know, 
that just requires kind of opportunity, good fortune, and it's not as scary as it necessarily sounds, and we think it's kind of rewarding. So we've been kind of thinking about this for a while, but let's start with the present, and let's just, let's, it's always good to start with the money, to think about the money, right? So the mobile application market value, which is primarily through advertising, was worth $177 billion in 2017. It increased its really staggering 143% over five years to $430 billion last year, and it's projected to go up to $638 billion in 2027. So this is serious money um, that we're talking about. And this is one of the things, kind of the market value of, of mobiles and the importance of personal data is something that for us is a kind of a basic driver of our research as a way to kind of think about and triangulate with the kind of the, the human and the cultural and social dimension of that. So, sorry, I completely went in the wrong direction. So, okay, the first time Jen and I started writing about this was not quite in 2005. Uh, 2007, but back in 2005, this was really, has anyone even heard of MySpace here? Okay, a few, probably because what, like didn't Justin Timberlake buy it or something about three or four years ago? Um, only 25 million. Only 25 million, million. sold for, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah, there, there's a bit of a, a haircut on, on MySpace. Um, it was a very different world. This was, well, first of all, this was a, a, a pre-smartphone. When we were thinking about this, we were coming at this very much from the perspective of kind of, uh, of, of digital culture. We were trying to understand the market value of something that was really new then, which was online kind of digital sociality, right? Because this was really the first meaningful social network that was, uh, that was digitally mediated. So when we first started to think about this, we took primarily theoretical perspective. We drew on the work of Maurizio Lazzarato. We picked up on the idea of immaterial labor. He used that to theorize um, labor in, you know, in the social factory, as it was called then, as in the biopolitical life world. This kind of built on some concepts from Michel Foucault around theorizing power, uh, uh, around the way that kind of primary paradigms of power, I don't know how much, if this is still being studied a little bit in some of your classes, from kind of sovereign to disciplinary to biopower. The key point of, of biopower is it's about making life productive, right? It's about, in the simplest, if you want to kind of take an image, you can imagine in an earlier historical moment where the productive capacity of labor happens the minute a worker kind of goes through the factory gates and begins to work and then ends when they leave. Now, think about your smartphone, think about your life. Think about how you live your life and how productive that is for you, for your own experiences, but also in terms of the value that gets generated so that's why we were kind of drawn to that. And it was also kind of drawing on more radical political economic theory um, from, from the Italian workless movement. Um, and we just had this notion of immaterial labor to be done, right? And the idea around that was that there is networked communication and social media as a new kind of cultural labor. This is what we were thinking in 2007 when this was was very new. Um, because, you know, what do we also do? Like, just think about the, emer like, this was at a time when, you know, the, the generation of kind of case preferences, uh, sort of affective communication, it wasn't a job, right? Um, but it was something that was beginning to happen and, and to be shared, and that there were new kinds of subjectivities that were emerging online. And so there was a, a, a fundamental creative power that this mediated social network brought about. And it has a kind of a, 
it's something that gets generated in surplus. And this is, this is if you want to try to take a, a progressive reading of this, then the idea is that the value that the, you generate might end up enriching Google or Facebook um, or Apple, but there's always an excess, right? It can't be contained within that. And in less theoretical and in more, let's say, practical computational terms, well, we can see that because that is the whole reason for gathering data because data in aggregate can never be exhausted of potential value. That is one of the single most important things about machine learning and especially the kind of the connectionist model um, because it looks to find interesting, statistically interesting relations between data points that are always open to generating new kinds of insights or new kinds of, of, of value, okay? So in that sense, I think, you know, the, the basic orientation still holds um, very much, although the, the technical environment has, has changed in every case, in every case. Um, so things have changed. I'm not gonna go over all of that, sense, it's what we know. This is how we live our lives. Times, the amount of time right, of your living day that you put in to various aspects right, uh, ha ha has just gone, it's just now something that we are all doing most of the time. So all of this, one way to think about this is this idea of datafication. Datification, when it was first presented in 2013, was a kind of, you know, it was, it was almost as if this is a neutral or objective process, and it's sort of something where there's almost like a belief system, right? And there was literally, you know, they talked about if we can collect all the data in terms of n equals all, to use the terminology of statistics, the problem of samples and of data modeling will disappear, right? So there's this idea that we can actually capture everything and then everything is computable and therefore knowable, right? I mean, I, I, I think we know very clearly that that's not the case. I mean, it's even interesting when I began to work a lot with computer scientists on this European um, uh, social data uh, analysis research infrastructure, questions of bias and discrimination were really narrow technical topics. I'm talking about 2015. Now it's quite clear that it is a fundamental problem that actually needs humanities and social science scholars. And I never really thought that some of my computer science colleagues would actually be interested in aspects of critical race studies, but actually now they are because there's a realization that datafication is not a neutral process. The process of gathering and using data from us is riven with power relations. It's a socio-technical process. Um, and it's, it's something where the transformation into actionable insights and value is something that happens very unevenly, let's say. So, you know, we can move toward and take up this concept of datafication and put a more critical spin on that, right? It's not neutral, it's never complete. Right? There's no objective quantification or tracking of human behavior and sociality, right? So we can start to think maybe there's a whole bunch of different ways, data balance is one way to think about this, and so we start to think about data and power. And we need to think about the role of the state and capital. And it's interesting when we take a global perspective on that as well, and we say, look at China, for example, and then contrast the role of the state and capital in terms of datafication with how that's playing out in other advanced capitalist nations. Okay, this brings us to the SDK, because what we're saying is the SDK is a key agent of datafication. Because what is it, uh, what we, we look at this technical object and what does it allow us to do? Well, it allows us to ask how are mobile devices and mediated cultural practices, apps, social media, et cetera, how are they integrating us ever deeper into digital assemblages, right? 
it's a, I mean, we can all just do a little kind of thought experiment and imagine, you know, what would a week without any kind of digital mediation and all that, what would that look like to you if you were still living not away in the woods, but actually you're living your normal everyday life? Like, how's datafication reconfiguring kind of political power relations in this unprecedented concentration of wealth and this emergence of new monopolies. And then really, how, how much agency do we have meaningfully? How much agency do we have over these processes, okay? So one of the things that we do is a lot of people talk in terms of platform studies. People study on the macro level, they look at these platforms and there's a lot of really important research on that and looking at infrastructures and we're kind of flipping that on its head and rather than looking at the macro level we're thinking about the micro level going down to these small you know whether we want to be to this micro scale of technical objects and so there's a whole rich history of conceptualizing things on the smallest of scales. So, so Lucretius, uh, going back 2,000 years, in when he, he, he wrote on the nature of things, he stated that the nature of things themselves were not to be discovered on the macro scale of the gods, and this was really important for him as he didn't seek to explain how things worked at that level of the gods, but rather at the smallest scale, the scale of atoms and void. And so this is why this is often called an atomistic perspective, right? That was taken up by, by Leibniz. He wrote about the com combinatorial arts. He would often say, let us calculate. Um, he was also somebody who followed the atomistic um, naturalist or natural philosophy at a time when he was developing um, new ways to compute the infinitely small, right? And this was at, along with Newton, and this is when calculus was actually being developed, right? Things that are still integral to modern computing and machine learning. Um, and the last thing, again, about the atomistic perspective when we look at this level is that we keep coming back to this generative capacity, right? And so I guess one of the things I suggest we should all be thinking about is how, how much kind of skin in the generative game do we really have in terms of the possibility of this beyond the kind of the functional outcomes that we get, right? And just even being able to think about it in those terms as opposed to just this straightforward data for service exchange that we have that kind of limits us. So we're trying to bring this atomistic perspective to the SDK, and we paraphrase Latour, who talks about the whole is always uh, smaller than its parts, right? And other people like um, Gabriel Tarb follow this. And we flip this and we say the small of the SDK is always larger than the whole of the platform. So this is a kind of a, a statement, and hopefully it might seem a little bit cryptic. When we do the workshop next week, it might be more straightforward. But what we're, in essence, trying to suggest is that if we look at this level of the smallest technical object, we see elements of the platform, but we see it diffused at a level. I don't want to jump ahead. We're, we're, we're going to get to that in a moment. I don't really want to talk about that. So I'm going to end my part of the talk with a view that I think many of you know. Um, I don't know how many of the students here have walked up the Aventine Hill and taken a look through that keyhole. And so we're suggesting that the atomistic perspective on the SDK is like that keyhole, which gives you this sort of surprisingly expansive view of Rome, but in this case, it gives us a surprisingly expansive view of the mobile 
ecosystem. So I'm gonna move, Jennifer is gonna come here. So now we're gonna go on a, on a bit of a roller coaster down into this, this very kind of uh, unique, small uh, world. But before we do that, we do what we're not supposed to do is take the big, uh, big perspective, but I think it's useful. <laughs> Um, and this is, this is a visualization, this is a network analysis of a project we did, I guess going back four years now, um, where uh, we decided to look at 5,000 applications in a database. Um, and you know, we, we wanted, you know, in, this, in this project, we wanted to understand uh, the mechanism, basically like how do, how do our apps gather data? tracking actually mean? What does, what does this actually look like? And how does it move um, from our phones to our operating systems, to the apps, to like the, out, to the outside world? And you know, you might, you know, so you know, in, in a, you know, one of the things that we, that we weren't really focusing on when we did this was that, you know, we didn't actually know about SDKs. We were more interested in questions around data governance which is like, what are the kind of mechanisms that control and allow for this data to move from one place to another? Because there's certain kind of contracts in your apps that like outline this, and this is what we wanted to look at. And then when we were looking at the kind of quote unquote trackers that were inside our application, we realized, wait a second, why is it that Facebook and Google, as you can see in this visualization, are in every single one of our applications? And this kind of light bulb went off and we kind of realized, and maybe this sounds quite straightforward, but at the time we were kind of, we thought a tracker is like kind of, you know, a secondary company. They work alongside big platforms. We hadn't quite realized that actually the trackers that we were imagining as being kind of these, these sort of more anonymous companies are actually the companies that we already know very well. Um, and so, uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> Canada research chair in data and I can't work out how to scroll but that's fine I'll just make it up uh, so you know as we can see from the 5,000 applications that we looked at and we can see on this picture Google and Facebook are extremely large and when we did a little bit more digging in our database we found that Google was actually attached to 90% of the apps that we looked at and Facebook was attached to over 60 percent of the apps that we looked at. And at the time, there was a computer scientist named Ruben Binz. I don't know if anyone knows any of his work. He's at Oxford University. He did, just to show us off, because we're just you know humanity scholars with 5,000, he looked at a million apps, obviously much more impressive. And his numbers were more or less the same as ours. So he also they also found like about 90% with Google, 60, 65% with Facebook. And this sort of set us down this rabbit hole of kind of thinking about why is this the case what does this mean? And also, what actually is a platform? Because we're used to thinking of these things as a first party, right? So the place that you go, where you log in, where you search, where you do things. But this actually says platforms are not just first parties. They're actually third parties. They're actually these kind of friends of apps that are there providing services for them. And so they're acting in this like double, this double identity, this like double, double function, double format. What does, what does this mean? And what is the role of the SDK in this, in this kind of scenario to kind of extend platforms in ways in which we didn't quite realize and it oftentimes don't even know that they're gathering data. Like, you know, for anyone that looked, you know, who follows, this is like my femtech having like looked at this, but you know, there was a study done in 36 apps that were tracking menstrual, menstrual cycles where 65% of them were just automatically throwing data through Facebook, whether you had an account or not. So this is not something that you have to have an account to have. This is just information about you that is going to these platforms without anyone really knowing what's happening. So this takes us here. What is this kind of weird thing? So uh, you didn't say. So SDK does stand for something. It stands for a software development kit, okay? And so the first point that we should make when we're asking and trying to define this thing is that it is basically a toolkit, like a little present that comes with a whole bunch of 
goodies inside it, right? Um, they're unique insofar as they come with connections to a number of platforms, a number of services. They, they do things for, for apps, right? So if you're an app developer, you're making a game, you don't know how to like advertise and make money this way, you wanna find a company that knows how to advertise for you so you can, make, so you can monetize your app. So you call and you bring in these little presents into your, into your application code and they're gonna help you, right? But also it's good to kind of remember that apps are, are assemblages. They are made up of many actors. There's no such thing as an app that gets written from scratch by one developer. They're always borrowing code from here, borrowing code from there, and they're making some kind of soup with this, and then they can kind of produce what it is that they want to produce much more quickly. So you find these different tools that exist, one, maybe just to actually create an app, a platform where the app can be created more quickly, uh, code for different kinds of fonts or, or organization, you need, you need space, right? Your app has to be housed on different cloud servers. So all of these different pieces, you know, also like, you know, I want my app to appear in, in Google Play and I want my app to appear on Apple, but that's totally different coding. So I can call on another SDK to help me, you know, organize this so it appears in both places. So all of these different tools are like swimming around everywhere. And as an app developer, you have to make decisions about what are the services that I'm gonna to grab towards me and help me build this? So when we think about a software development kit, these are kind of, um, they provide many different services. They're not one thing, they're not just trackers. They provide like all kinds of different things to help developers. And then they connect to all of these different platforms and companies. So one of you, for anyone who, who here has heard of an API, knows what an API is, Anyone not really sure? It's okay to admit, because I didn't really know much about any of this. <laughs> okay, so um, the second point is SDKs are, are not APIs, but they contain them. So for those of you that don't know what an API is, an application protocol index, the internet like wouldn't exist without these things. They're basically the connections between that allow different things to talk to one another. So if you imagine going to a website and it has Google Maps inside it, there's an API there because the, the website that you went to didn't create Google Maps. They said, hey, Google Maps, we wanna use you on our website. Can I have access and put you here? And Google Maps says, yep, I'm gonna give you this number so I know who you are and what you're doing. And then in return, I'm gonna allow you access to my Google Maps and it will be there. In the same way you buy an airline ticket, you go to like, you know, Skyscanner, give me the best price. Skyscanner doesn't have all the prices. What they have is APIs to all these different companies. And so when you make your search, I wanna go from Rome to, to Mexico, all the prices come up and, and it's because they're able to connect to all of these different websites through APIs. So they're just the way in which you get information that exists one place into another, right? So for the SDK, obviously APIs are very important because you're giving access to these different platforms, but you can't make an app out of an API, um, but you can make an app out of an SDK. So that's the difference, is that SDKs are coming with instructions, they're coming with, with you know, ways to kind of fix things if there are problems, they're coming with code that you put into the app, and they're coming with connections to these different platforms. So there are a whole bunch of different things. Okay. And this is like a strange picture that Mark had Dolly draw, draw Google through a keyhole, but they didn't quite get Google right. <laughs> Maybe it's better that way. I don't know. <laughs> if we come back to our metaphor of the keyhole, you know, what do we see when we look at Google's SDK from this microscopic rather, you know, what universe is created and sustained and reproduced to the object that resides in almost every single uh, one of the applications on all of your phones right now. So I'm gonna show you a slightly overwhelming um, visualization and this is, I think, why I've like, lost eyesight and become slightly mad over the last year trying to kind of um, code all of these um, websites that that actually map out these services in plain sight for all of you to kind of see. 
and this is this is you know just to kind of and and, and also kind of helps to maybe um, explain why we're taking this microscopic perspective. But what you're looking at is Firebase. So this is Google's primary SDK, although they have a whole bunch of them. And these are all the services that they offer to developers if they want to build their app. And so, um, you know, when we look at this overwhelming number of services, you know, maybe a clear understanding of how a platform like Google has been able to ingratiate itself into the hearts and minds of developers with uh, so many you know, general and bespoke services, including like AI facial recognition. So you wanna do facial recognition on your app, you don't know how to do this, you know, Google offers this to you and in exchange it takes all of the faces that you capture from your app, right? Just as one kind of example, not just advertising. You know, and so, you know, this kind of service as an infrastructure, sort of a play, because in kind of tech world, they would say infrastructure as a service, which is what like Microsoft does. We're saying this kind of service, so all of these different kind of possible services, whether it's profile building, cloud messaging, in-app messaging, um, different kinds of tracking, uh, different kinds of crash reporting, cloud service, cloud services where you can house things, different kinds of remote access, and so on and so forth. All of these different things can be, pick, you can pick and choose what you need for your app. And in exchange for every single one of these services, because they all come with their own terms and like privacy policies, they all come from terms, they all have their own terms and conditions. That means they all individually take different data from your app, right? So whether they get it in one place or another, that actually could be about three or four different parts of that same SDK taking data about you from your phone. And in that sense, it makes it, um, you know, we can start to understand the ways in which platforms are not just kind of growing in the way that they're kind of gathering more users, but actually growing through this infrastructure that's very distributed um, in a kind of quiet, innocuous kind of way. And I know we're kind of getting towards uh, the end of our talk, so I've just kind of, I want to just sort of end with this. So we, we've tried to kind of make sense of this by looking at uh, a number of different applications and trying to kind of categorize what are the kinds of data that are being gathered by these SDKs. Uh, and we've, we've kind of created three, this is sort of a preview for those of you who want to come to the workshop where we'll kind of work more uh, coherently with this, but there's three kind of clear categories of services that SDKs offer to developers. One is um, what we call programmatic ad tech. So this is what we would, I think, traditionally associate with tracking. This is the entire kind of advertising ecosystem. Uh, and we have kind of specific kinds of services that are on offer and different SDKs that specialize in all of them. And of course, Firebase that offers everything. So it's uh, um, advertising, attribution, this is more like what we would associate with proper tracking, right? Because if you advertise, then you need some return on investment. You need to know person X saw your ad, where did they see it? What did they do? Did they buy something? So we need to send like little kind of trackers out there to follow Jen. Did she see the ad? Yes, yeah, she saw the ad. Where'd she go? What'd she touch? What'd she do? Where'd that ad come from? All of this information needs to be gathered and brought back. And then if the kind of advertiser is happy, yeah, that was a good ad. We spent some good money. We keep sending you money to give Jen more ads. So this kind of attribution tracking, right? Or, you know, is it kind of, or the services around engagement? It's like, okay, we can track her if she sees it, but are we gonna get her to look at the ad? We need to know who she is, right? Because what's this game about? It's about making sure that she sees the right ad at the right time about the right thing that's in the right color and then she's actually going to pay attention to it and then we can like track her around so we need to know who she is so this these kinds of engagement kinds of companies they're all around building these profiles in order to make these things then we have app development and this is i think for us a kind of question mark because when we looked at firebase just quickly we saw that that um five out of the nine development service that it offers was taking things like your IP address, which according to GDPR is actually illegal. They're not supposed to take your um, IP address because it's location data and that's not actually being disclosed. So we have these types of things. So this is around app creation, the cloud access and database support, 
um, and then different kinds of API, API tools that are there in the background connecting. And then this other category, uh, which we call app enhancement, and this is, these are kind of the, these are the SDKs that you actually know exist in your app. So maybe you, you, go, to, you go to shopping app, but you don't want to like spend it all right now, so you'll use like Klarna or like PayPal, and I'll pay in three months, and it'll be okay because I great dress. Um, this is, these are SDKs as well. So these kinds of third-party services that as, as a user, you actually can see they're there, right? Or like you logged in with Apple or you logged in with Google. Again, these are there. And then, um, yeah, so th these are the kind of categories. And then the last point I make is the super SDK, which we've kind of added to this, which is reserved for special SDKs that go into every single one of these categories, like, like Firebase that we, just, uh, that we just looked at. And I just want to kind of close by saying, you know, on the one hand, I think when we think about tracking, there's a kind of, there's this kind of like, oh, you know, well, it's, it just happens. We're just getting tracked. Like, there's nothing we can do about it. And then we have this whole other kind of, uh, like, line of discourse that I have nothing to hide and therefore I have nothing to fear. So it's, so it's perfectly fine. I don't mind that they take that. But then we start to kind of think about what are the ways in which we're using our applications? What, are the, what is the kind of data that we're actually putting inside our, our apps? Like, on one hand, we're playing games. On the other hand, we're using them for our mental health. On the other hand, we're using them increasingly for our health. Uh, on the other hand, we're, we're putting very sensitive information about our body, about our sexual habits, about you know pregnancies, whatever it is, inside our applications. And there's no real safeguarding of this data. There's no kind of real kind of special category, especially when these these platforms like Google is inside, likely inside these apps. Yeah, and just just to kind of follow up on that really quickly, if I can just go through the sorry wrong way. Just if, if we look, Jennifer was saying about how different categories of data are being taken by an SDK. Um, so we can think about the same data being taken and following multiple streams. And we can then start to, so on the one hand, this is sort of what we were talking about when we said the small of the SDK is, uh, is bigger than the large of the platform, because we can see how expansive this is, we can get a sense of how it's not just kind of trying to theorize at a higher level to talk about a kind of a generative capacity, but we can see how it's a very practical um, exercise for a company like Google and developers we're, we're working with some people, really interesting people in cybersecurity, we work with developers all the time. Developers need to get a job done, and so when they're offered something like Google Firebase that does everything, well, what do most of us do when something comes along and helps us kind of, you know, become incredibly productive, but then also do great functionality? We use it, but we can just kind of get this sort of we can see questions around AI or machine learning, how in a mundane way an SDK integrates this into our app. And on the one hand, you know, you want that facial recognition, you want to work when you want to have it, but then you start to think about creating data sets to build up and how Search on in, in, in for a, a related project, and you sort of then realize the way that the labeling of that training data goes to, to you know small uh, precarious labor all over the world, and and sort of there's all kinds of security implications, and then there's kind of racialized deployment of that, and we can see how. There's small little strands that are that are going across and, and feeding into that through SDKs, and ultimately, you know, again, besides the super SDK, I mean, Google first and foremost, Facebook secondarily, and then we need.
need to look at the Chinese ecosystem, but that's another which paper. Is its, <laughs> which is its own other world. So I, I guess the last thing that we'd like to say is that we don't see this as I'm trying to take a, a kind of a more critical orientation or understanding of these processes. We see this as a way of kind of grounding it more specifically allowing us to ask even more specific questions and ultimately as a way where we, again in a grounded way, demand more because there's a recognition of this profound generative value of our collective data as we live our lives so deeply integrated into these processes. If to at best have a kind of a data for service. Collectively selling ourselves short on what we can do and how we can actually bring about different kinds of, of more meaningful change and a kind of more equitable you know, continuing to feed these super SDKs, which just continue to to I I expand the so yeah on that note that's the end of our presentation. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that SDKs are basically time uh, time saving; they're profitable, and that's why I guess most developers make use of it. But so this means that there is no obligation, for example, to have your app uh, on platforms like Play Store, uh, Google App Store, to actually have an SDK in them. It means that the programmers simply prefer to use it for all the uh, for all the components that facilitate their process. All right. Uh, then another question, uh, which I haven't actually mentioned, but just glazed over right now. Uh, does TikTok, for example, being a Chinese uh, application, use different kind of SDKs, like, mm, yes, less, uh, Western SDKs, let's say. Yeah, those are those are really great questions. Um, the the I, I will, the first the first question I, I I didn't fully understand it as a question. Is it, you just could you just repeat the first one? It's like the TikTok one. I'll go forever on, but I just want to make sure I get the first one. <laughs> I mean, there's not really an obligation, but because of the way that apps are made, it's the kind of, it's the way, you know? Uh, that because it would just take too much time for developers to create everything themselves, and then plus, they're there to kind of create their own product or their own object that has a, a value, but then they need other things that has nothing to do with their expertise, and so then they start to kind of draw on these services. But what's interesting, and I've read this in a few kind of like blo like blogs and forums and stuff like that, so not an academic, it's not a lot of written on this, but um, it's difficult to use SDKs that are not like Facebook and Google because once you start to use these two, they take up so much bandwidth and the last thing anyone wants if they're making an app is for it to be slow, right? That's not good for, you're not gonna keep an app on your phone if it takes forever to load everything. And so the more SDKs you have, then potentially the slower it's going to be. So that's why a lot of developers make choices to take SDKs that have the most number of services. So then they only have to update a few times as opposed to like a many, many, many times. And that kind of works very much in favor of those platforms to keep them in that dominant position. 
competition. And there's like disputes and all kinds of you know discussion about that. But so that's kind of one point. And then in terms of like in terms of uh, in terms of TikTok, the Chinese ecosystem is like a whole other world. Like if if you have 18 average SDKs inside of like a kind of Western app inside a Chinese app, it's apps like probably 30 to 35 SDKs inside of inside of TikTok. You, it's an interesting place to look as well because we tend to think of Chinese apps as being very separate from Western apps, like they have their own kind of variations and yet behind the scenes, we can start to ask this question like how Chinese is a Chinese app or even how, how um, non-Western is a Western app. Like in an app like ASOS, we can look inside and oh, there's, there's an SDK from Huawei, which we would not expect, but there's this kind of um, Chinese database cloud support service from ASOS, just like when we look inside of uh, TikTok, we have we have Firebase um, and a few other um, Western companies that are there. So, I think it's an interesting kind of it's an interesting place to look and interesting debates like that are happening right now. When U.S. they're trying to ban TikTok, but then they're going to ring fence you know American data inside Texas. I'm not sure how this works <laughs> because when you look at this, it's like well you know. If, if one SDK is sending data and like and shooting it in all of these directions, and then you have 30 companies behind the scene like in tech, TikTok, I say good luck to that. Or maybe the people who are making these decisions don't really understand how these processes work. Yeah, and if I can just add, I mean, like this is this is an area that's still relatively under researched, and I think can be incredibly illuminating because when again, if we go back then assumptions that we make kind of geopolitical sort of structures seeing around tech giants, things get more complicated. They're not quite as clear cut. The kind of, you know, as, as Jen said, like how Chinese is a Chinese app, how Western is a Western app. And we start to be able to see, and maybe sometimes it has to do going back to those sort of functional demands because again you know simplest thing if you want to kind of have a kind of a catchphrase for an SDK, SDKs make apps work and they help apps make money. Right? And so sometimes TikTok has you know want the engagement, they want the money, and it also speaks to the relative level or lack of regulatory oversight on these technical objects that this is just literally passing. It's right here, but where is it? Who knows? We don't know. Hi. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, so speaking of the lack of regulatory oversight, the, the TikTok trial, how might we put people in position to help our politicians who are clearly ignorant to how these things work? My, my cynical answer or <laughs> is welcome. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like there are just some basic visualization of the SDKs inside of um, ASOS, there's 18 of them, just on average, perfect. Um, and then when you read the terms and conditions like of the app, because if you go to the app store and then it says, you know, this app takes and it will have some kind of list of data that it takes, and then it has like the kind of the classic lines that you see everywhere, which is, we may share data with third parties. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's a very like kind of simplistic way of standing in for this that you're looking at right now. So I think that, you know, just as a starting point that, you know, if it's your data that's being gathered, if it's my data that this app wants, I should have a very clear understanding of who is actually there, how many hands are actually at the table. Because in workshops that, you know, I've run with communities where we've kind of, you know, had people kind of make decisions around which app they would 
download which app they would download once we gave them like five apps and showed behind the scenes some took some there were may, way more hands than others um, this actually impacted people's decision right so if you could see this app there's five hands at the table but this one has 40 you might make it you might make a different kind of decision so I think there needs to be just on a basic this is not a difficult thing to do anyone as we'll do um, for those coming to the workshop can do this quite easily by looking at the files so this should be I think as a starting point baseline there for people to be able to see and then in terms of like cap data capture this is where I get more cynical because if we look at a lot of the discourse even like within I mean it's good we have the GDPR it's definitely better than nothing like compared to you know the US where it's California or nothing where there's any protection and it's actually fine to take you know uh, femtech data and send it to employers that want to buy it so they can see which women are trying to get pregnant and not hire them that's you know so they can't do that quite in the same way here um, but a lot of it is sort of you know well we need tracking because everyone is kind of not really saying it but knows it that this is actually what's sustaining um, the digital uh, eco ecosystem but so we'll just make it harder for people to identify you but then this you know where mark is talking about a lot of these ai processes you know there's actually a question mark like actually if we're bringing certain data together can can we be identified so this is where you know i think it gets trickier but ultimately a lot of no one is actually trying to stop tracking they're just trying to stop tracking so it connects with you and this is i think a larger social problem that we have to all collectively find solutions to yeah, and, and if I can just quick, quickly add to that, I mean, you know, we, in the process of putting together another research SDKs, but with some with some people in cybersecurity that have a really strong, so that they can kind of build something they can do. So really, what matters is that if you can kind of demonstrate it can emulate. This is part of the problem. Part of the problem is easily open up our phones to a dynamic analysis where we can take the black box and we can see the data that's input and we know exactly where it goes and but there are ways with, with the test bed that can allow us to gain a better understanding of that and we've talked about and thought about ways in which we can first of all because we think it's more important very different needs around the that are utilized. And even though we don't mean to say that kind of these modes of critical data literacy are some kind of panacea, because they're not, but at the same time, for people to become more empowered, they need to have a clear understanding of things. But also thought about, you know, how can this There was a real lack of understanding. We thought there's almost certification so that we can say, this is how this works. Okay, if you're still going to and not regulate, that's fine, but let's not have this be because we don't know and therefore there are no efforts. So we kind of feel like there is room to open up these processes to more hearing eyes as a way to maybe bring about better kind of governance and regulation. I think we're getting more, and as, you know, as Jennifer keeps talking about the, the importance of the way bodies and different bodies are differentially integrated and feeling the impacts of this, we, we, we need more agency. Otherwise, I mean, let's be honest, look at the not the right path that invariably has to have the way that people live their lives even more. And the whole point of the kind of data for service 
this exchange is that it's supposed to augment. It's supposed to do something. It's supposed to bring something that's better. We have to be careful about what type of bargain we set. Thank you very much. Um, I follow up. Um, so seeing as though data collection is primarily um, affecting younger generations, I imagine that um, Starting a campaign for critical data literacy is almost like fighting fire with fire because, <laughs> I mean, we're trying to get the word out there, but then you have to use the systems that are in place in order to do that. How might we <laughs> do that? Um, how might we go about um, doing that? I mean, my honest answer to that question is I've been asking myself the exact same question for many, many years. And uh, it's sort of taken me down into this rabbit hole. And I think on a personal level, I just feel like, you know, I spent a long time kind of theorizing and, and talking about these things and then not really understanding what it is that, what's going on. So, you know, for, for my kind of academic pathway, it's, it's been around trying to get a handle and understanding of how these, how the tech, to kind of take the technical in the kind of techno-social seriously so that there can be new kinds of discussions, new kinds of understandings, and hopefully, you know, when we then start to kind of engage, you know, whether it's engaging communities or engaging stakeholders, we can have different kinds of, of conversations. And, you know, certainly at the end of this work, it's around how do we kind of open up at least a kind of, you know, transparency around what's happening, I think, as a kind of baseline. Um, and then the next question is, if we have that kind of transparency, then how do we then start to have different kinds of discussions where then ethics doesn't always have to come from above, but there can be a kind of, you know, ethics from below perspective of how our end users actually feeling this impact and then finding ways, you know, as, as scholars of being able to feed that forward so that there can be a kind of dialogue and sort of situate in between. So I'm not sure if that helps, but I think about this question a lot. <laughs> That's where I am. <laughs> Everybody has limitations on what they can bring to a project, and they realize that the only way to extend their understanding is by working with other people who have other kinds of skill sets. And you don't need every programmer, you don't need every cybersecurity like skull. You, you need one, and you need two. That's it. And then you work together, and then two leads to and these kind of interesting networks. So be open and definitely don't worry so much about what you don't know because we all have hard limits and look more to you know what you can learn and how you can extend from working with other people because it's, it's also kind of liberating in, in a lot of ways. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it's more a comment than a question, but first of all, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. I think a lot of the questions sort of start from that point, you know, it's sort of where, how do you move uh, sort of forward? But I also, in some sense, I'd like to sort of thank for the work that you are doing because this kind of interdisciplinary work, I think, even from a very practical perspective, is super useful. It seems that, you know, the prints has more of an ear for someone that speaks from a technical perspective than someone that speaks, you know, for a Maurizio Lazzarato, for someone that speaks from a purely social critical perspective. You know, they, there's a complete wall that separates the theoretical from the regulatory, the institutions, etc. But it seems as if 
you can surreptitiously insert that sort of ethical political perspective if you speak that sort of technical language. And I think that is increasingly sort of important. And I imagine that that's the kind of realization that sort of keeps your work going forward. know who you're talking to. Like, is this the right number? Right? And then you start and you realize, okay, it's a long path, but it's one that actually has become way more open and inclusive, I think, in some ways, or at least it's open to possibilities. So it's the right time if there's any, and just, just one last thing there, this isn't about becoming, maybe somebody does want to but it's not about you, like if you're like you're saying, oh, but I do kind of you know critical theory or I look at digital media, you can still do that. If you can do that with a bit more grounding and a bit more kind of open collaboration, you don't become the other person. You extend yourself by kind of working with those other people. Yeah, that's always a sort of extend that. It's I mean, you know, you guys and there's lots of scholars that do this work like Adrian McKenzie, or he's been doing this like longer than us. Um, but I think it's just we're in a kind of moment where I would say just don't be scared of these technological processes. Like when we when we did when I started and did my first project, I actually had to go and get the the the, uh, the, the, the guy who was doing all the programming drunk so that and then I recorded like a conversation, and I asked him all these questions, but I had no clue what he was saying. So he was speaking this completely different language. And then I transcribed our interview like in the pub where he was relaxed. And then finally, I'm like, okay, I can find this common ground <laughs> where we can start to have a conversation. And it, you know, from there, actually, like, I learned quite a lot. So I think for, for you know, for our discipline as well, it's really important to kind of embrace the technical, even though it can be Embrace collaboration and transdisciplinarity. 